Welcome to this beginner's tutorial on Nextdoor, which is a piece of music sequencing software for the ZX Spectrum Next. This software will run directly on the ZX Spectrum Next hardware, or like myself, you can run it through an emulator. And if you wish to run it through an emulator, there will be instructions on how to do that at the end of this video. Nextdoor was written by Gary Biasolo and it's available from his website, which I will link to in the description. Nextdoor utilises the three built-in AY sound chips that are in the ZX Spectrum Next, which gives you a full nine channels of sound to play with. Upon loading, we're presented with this screen, which is the Song Arranger screen. And you can get to the Song Arranger screen at any time by clicking this first button here in the top left. However, I'm going to start us off by taking us to the file, save and load screen which is under the fourth button. It's worth pointing out at this point that on the ZX Spectrum Next hardware there should be a list of files here. However I'm using the CSpect emulator so these files don't show for some reason. However it is still possible to load and save your work. So what I'm going to do is decide what I'm going to call my song by double clicking where it says new song. There we go. I'll delete that and we're going to call it my song press return. Now when I click save, which is this button, it asks me if I want to save my song.daw and I'm going to click yes. That will save that file into the same folder on my computer as the CSpect emulator. And to load that back in, when I first load the emulator, I'm going to go back to the load save file screen. Here it will say new song. Again you'll just have to double click on that and type in the name of your file which is as you saw my song you don't have to put the DAW in press return now when I click load which is this button it will ask me if I want to load my song which is saved in the CSWIC folder and I click yes and my song will load and that's how you save and load on an emulator the second button here is the piano roll editor now the piano roll editor will allow us to create sequences of notes that we can drop into our song arrangement on the song arranger screen. Currently however if I click that second button it doesn't take us anywhere because I haven't yet created an empty sequence of notes. I'll come back to that later. This third button will take us to the patch editor. The patch editor is the tool which allows us to create our instruments so from here you can create a bass sound or a piano sound or whatever you want. These default settings here will give you the following sound, which is the default instrument. And I'm triggering those sounds by pressing keys on my computer keyboard. The computer keyboard is used to represent a piano keyboard. So these are the four main sections of Nextdoor. You have the song arranger, the piano roll editor, the patch editor, and the save load screen. The fifth button give you this screen of credits. You can pause the video now and have a read if you like. A good starting point before we begin to create our song would be the patch editor, so I'll explain the patch editor now. Instruments are stored under slots 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. And you can adjust which slot you're working on by clicking the forward and backward arrows. So patch 1, this is the instrument stored under slot 0. I'm going to double click and rename that to piano. So, so I know which instrument I'm working with. The ADSR section stands for attack, decay, sustain and release. And this will affect aspects of your instrument like how long it takes for the instrument to fade in, how long it's held for and how long it takes to fade out. Rather than explaining what each individual one does exactly, I'll let you just fiddle with that yourself until you get an instrument that you're happy with the sound of. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to have a fiddle with these settings until I get an instrument that I'm happy with.
OK, I'm happy with that. You can add a vibrato effect to your instrument by clicking here. That switches it on, and there are four settings. Delay, Rate, Amount, and Count. Delay will affect how long it takes for the vibrato effect to kick in after you trigger an instrument. Rate affects the speed of the vibrato. Amount affects how much vibrato you want. And count will increase the intensity of the vibrato the longer the note is held. I'm happy with that. The glide function allows us to smoothly transition between notes. So what it basically does is it gives us a pitch bending effect. So without glide switched on, you'll hear that the notes jump directly from one to the next. But if we switch on glide, we get this. The settings available under Glide are Mode and Speed. Now the mode settings are as follows. Off, which is self-explanatory. Speed, Time, and Chromatic. I'm not going to go into great details now. I'll let you experiment with that yourself. But for the sake of this demonstration, I'm just going to set it to Time. The speed obviously affects how fast the Glide is. So I'll go with that for now. Now for the purposes of demonstrating delay, I'm going to switch off the glide effect just so that we can focus on what delay sounds like. Delay introduces a delay or reverb type effect. To the layman, that's echo. So without delay enabled, the notes just sound normal. But if I switch on delay, we get this nice effect. The four settings available under Delay are Mix, Duration, Feedback and Tuning. Mix will increase how much delay you want to apply to the instrument. Duration changes the amount of time between each echo. Feedback changes the volume of the actual echo itself. And Tuning changes the pitch of the echoed note. Now these first three are pretty self-explanatory, but I would like to demonstrate the tuning. As you can hear, that makes quite a difference to the pitch of the echo itself. The only practical application I've found for that is that if I make subtle changes to the tuning, I get what the professionals would call a phasing effect. Now the delay function is also affected by this section here, OSC2, which I believe stands for Open Sound Control. It has two settings, octave and type, and these settings affect your echoed note, the delayed note. Octave will change the octave of the delayed note. So currently our note and the echo are playing at the same pitch, like this. But if I drop the octave down by one step, the delayed note, or the echoed note, will sound like this. The type setting is a little bit more complicated. It affects the position in the channel list of your echoed note. So what you have to understand is that when the spectrum chip is playing that echoed note, it's overlaying it on top of the main note. So you're getting your note and you're getting your echo kind of at the same time. So it needs to select a separate channel on which to play the echo. If you have the setting at its default, which is plus one here, then if you have your note on channel one, the echo will play on the next channel down, which will be channel 2. If you have your note placed on channel 6, the plus 1 setting 
will play the echo on channel 7 and obviously if you place any notes on that channel where the echo is going to be located it will overwrite the echo so you need to bear that in mind. The second setting, plus 2, will place the echo two steps down in the channel list from where your note is so if you're on channel 1 it will play the echo note on channel 3 two steps down. Plus 3, this setting here will play the note three steps down in the channel list. The remaining three settings are left, center, and right. And if you have the setting to left, the software will look for the next available open channel positioned on the left. If you have the setting to center, the software will look for the next available open channel in the center. And if you have it set to right, it will look for the next available open channel on the right. So this controls where your echoed note is located. This brings me on to the OSC1 section, which doesn't relate to delay, it relates to the instrument in general. There are two settings, semi and fine. Semi allows you to transpose your instrument up or down in semitone steps. Fine allows you to fine tune the pitch of your instrument. Envelope is an interesting one. For the purpose of demonstrating that I'm going to switch off delay. Envelope gives you what I would describe as a harder sounding note. So without envelope this is what your note sounds like currently. If I switch on envelope this is what you get. Other than to say that this means wave and this means frequency, I'm going to let you experiment with that yourself. This area over here consists of two parts. We have amplitude, which is currently highlighted, and noise. And I'll explain what each of these does in turn as we go on. Amplitude, put quite simply, gives you the option to change the overall volume of the instrument and it's also flexible enough to provide you with the opportunity to apply a wavering tremolo effect where the volume wavers up and down as the note is played. To demonstrate the amplitude effect I'm first going to turn off vibrato so that you can appreciate the difference that amplitude makes. Obviously we switch on the amplitude function and all you need to know at this stage is that this column on the left, just this column here currently, controls the overall volume of the piano instrument. So if I play the note, that's full volume. To make it quieter, I can bring this bar down in one step increments, and you can hear that the instrument is getting quieter and quieter the lower we move it. So that's pretty basic stuff. We now know that this first column controls overall volume of the instrument. But how do we get this tremolo effect? What we need to understand at this stage is that in addition to this one column there are also 15 other columns along here. Here's the second column, here's the third column and so on. We can also change the level of volume on any one of these columns but as you can hear it makes no difference to the sound of the instrument. This is because the second, third and fourth column that I've just adjusted there have not yet been activated and the way we activate the columns is by right clicking on the lower bar down here with one green box highlighted. Currently it's showing that the first column highlighted in green on this row is active. If we activate the second column we right click on it to do that we get this. Let's pronounce that a little bit more. Now there's that tremolo effect I was talking about and again, if we change the levels on the third and fourth columns, it's still going to make no difference because the third and the fourth columns are not activated. So what we've got here is a cycling effect to the volume, where the volume is up and then it's down, then it's up and then it's down, and it will keep doing that until the note ends. And we can change the speed of that by increasing or decreasing this value here. If we increase the value, it will increase the delay between the two volume levels, between the two columns, and we now get this. If we increase it one more, we get this. So as you can tell, you can get that interesting tremolo effect by activating each column and changing each column's volume levels.
In addition to that, of course, we can activate or deactivate as many columns as we like. So a right click here on the third column will activate the third column. A right click here on the sixth column will activate the sixth column. A left click here on the second column will deactivate the first. A left click here, and so on and so forth. You can see what I'm doing there. So currently, with these three columns active, you can make adjustments to those three columns. So, in addition to being able to change the range along here by right clicking and left clicking, there's something else we can do with the second row of green dots. And I'm about to demonstrate that, but before I do, let me change everything back to default here so we can start from scratch. So what I'm going to show you now is what this second row of green dots is for. First of all, I'll start by activating the first six columns. Is that six? Yes, that's six. So we now have these columns to play with, but I'm going to leave the volume at maximum for now. The second row of dots can be clicked and they turn red. And what this does is it deactivates any column where you've clicked a red dot. So now we get this effect, kind of an on-off, 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 rapid and we can obviously increase the amount of delay as I explained before by increasing that value. I'll leave it at 1 for now. It's also worth noting at this point that you can see column 1 and column 2 that pattern is just repeated on 3 and 4 and 5 and 6 so really there's no need currently to activate 6 columns. We turn off these red dots and reduce the range to just two, it will cycle through those two over and over again anyway, rather than cycling through six, and you get the same effect. Now that we've demonstrated amplitude, I'm going to change the settings back to default so we can leave this and turn off the amplitude option. Now I'm going to be showing you what noise does. The noise option, which is brought up by clicking its tab and activating it with its button, introduces white sound to your note which is useful for creating drum type sounds. So what we get now with the noise switched on is a mixture of notes and white sound. If we disable noise again it's just the note. But you may not want a mixture of note and noise so in order to disable the note we have to go to amplitude and activate it and click a red dot here to deactivate this entire column which will deactivate the note giving us just white noise and it's worth pointing out that if we have this column active and reduce the volume it will reduce the volume of the note and the noise so if you want noise and no note it has to be done this way by clicking a red dot here and deactivating the column entirely now the final thing to explain about the noise tab is that it has the same columns that you get in the amp tab and you can activate them and deactivate them in the same way and you can change the range with a right click and a left click in exactly the same way. The only difference with the columns is that rather than changing the volume of the white noise, these columns under the white noise tab, they change the pitch of the white noise. So at the column's lowest level, you get this type of sound, which is a more hissy, high-end type sound. At its highest level, you get a bassier sound. And in the middle, it's kind of mid-range. And like with the amplitude tab, you can change multiple columns and have those selected to get different types of sound. Now I'm going to change the settings for piano back to the piano type sound because we're going to move on from here. There's our nice normal piano sound. So moving on, we're now going to look at the final feature of the patch editor the arpeggio function. And what the arpeggio function allows you to do is it allows you to take one note and make it sound as if it's playing more than one note at the same time on one channel. And the way it does this is it allows you to select multiple notes, then it will rapidly cycle through those multiple notes at a fast speed, and what you'll end up with is a sound which you'll recognize from a lot of classic spectrum music. I will demonstrate that in a moment.
We'll begin by switching on the arpeggio function by tapping its power button. I'll also disable vibrato at this point so that the vibrato effect doesn't interfere with the arpeggio effect for the purposes of demonstration. Now down here we have these two green rows again which are the same as the two green rows up here which I've already demonstrated and we can adjust the range of steps here by right clicking and left clicking to adjust the range. So currently our note sounds like this. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to enable the first three steps here, these first three columns are now enabled. Now these sliders here, rather than adjusting volume, they will adjust the pitch of each step of the note. So we have three steps to this note, and the note sounds normal. But if I bring the second step down, and the third step down even further, you can hear the difference it makes as it rapidly cycles through these three notes. Let me just make some adjustments on the fly so you can hear the differences. leave that like that for now. The speed knob here will adjust the speed, obviously. It introduces more delay to the steps so you get a slower rotation. And the higher you put this, the easier it is to notice the difference in what you've done. We'll leave that at level 1 for now. Now the synchronized setting here, I'll be honest with you, it's a little bit of a mystery to me. I haven't found any real practical use for it. With the setting to off, your note just sounds the way you set it. The next setting is on, and it seems to make the note more drawn out. The third and final setting went a bit haywire. The third and final setting is hard, which almost completely disables the note. So as this is a little bit of a mystery to me, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read out the section of the manual that explains what this synchronization function does. So from the manual, the pitch arpeggiator at the bottom has an additional sync knob to control how notes are triggered for each step. The default is off, which will play the amplitude ADSR normally. The on mode will re-trigger the ADSR, but the current amplitude level will be retained. Finally, the hard mode also re-triggers the ADSR, but the amplitude will be reset to zero. So that's what the manual says about the sync function. Now before we move on to learning how to create sequences of notes that can be placed into a song, I first need to create four new instrument sounds. We're going to be putting together a simple demo song for the purposes of this tutorial. The piano instrument, which is currently on slot 0, that will form the main melody. I will also need a bass sound to form the bass line. I'll need a bass drum and a snare drum and a hi-hat sound to form the drum beat. So I'll go ahead and do that now. The piano sound, I'm going to apply glide to that. I'll also need to disable the arpeggio and I'm going to have some delay on it. I'll leave the OSC type setting at plus one, which means that wherever I place the piano instrument, which is likely to be channel one, the echo will be placed on channel two automatically. Our bass sound I'm going to place in slot one. I'm going to rename that bass. I'm going to change the settings now until it's how I want it to sound. That's fine. So now for our bass drum, which I'm going to put on slot 2, we'll re rename that a bass drum. 
So we'll need some noise on this. I want to switch off the note sound. Okay, go back to the noise tab. I'll stick that uh, at the top to get a lower kind of sound. May increase the range just a little bit. See how that sounds. Nah, keep the range at one. Right, just make some adjustments to the ADSR because that goes on a little bit too long. I need less attack. Now we're getting closer. I think that'll do. Now I want to use my bass drum settings as a basis to create my hi-hats and my snare. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click this button here which copies everything on this screen. Then if I go to slot 3 where I want my hi-hat, I can click this button to paste the bass drum settings. So now I'll rename the instrument in slot 3 to hi-hat. Let's have a listen to that. It's the same as the bass drum at the moment. Let's take it to around about the mid range. Okay, I'll have that, but I'm going to change some of the ADSR settings. See what we can get. So for our snare sound, I'm going to go back to the bass drum settings and copy those and paste them into slot number 4. And I'm going to rename that to snare drum, which currently sounds the same as the bass drum. Let's bring it down to here, which is a higher, higher pitched noise. Actually, I've just realised the hi-hat kind of needs to be down there, doesn't it? Let's have a look. Yeah, yeah, that actually would make more sense. So our hi-hat will now sound like this. Yep, I like that. And back to the snare drum, we want that somewhere in the mid-range. Yeah, I'm happy with that. For the purposes of this demo song, that's absolutely fine. So here we have the Song Arranger screen, and we can come to this screen at any point by clicking the first button here that will bring us to this screen. Here we have the file name of the song that we're working on. We cannot edit that from here. That can be changed in the File Select menu. This shows us which version of the software we're running. These boxes here, I believe that's supposed to say Tempo, but I think there may be some issues with the fact that I'm running this software through an emulator, so that's probably why they're showing us squares. But tempo refers to this dial here, which allows us to adjust the beats per minute of our song. If we reduce the beats per minute, it will slow our song down. If we increase the beats per minute, it will speed the song up. For now, for this demo song, we're going to leave it on the standard setting of 125 beats per minute. This column here shows us our nine channels of sound that we have to play with. Of the nine channels, they are named AY1, L, C and R, AY2, L, C and R, and AY3, L, C and R. The AY refers to the sound chips inside the ZX Spectrum Next. The Spectrum Next has three AY sound chips. Each one is capable of producing three channels of stereo sound. The L refers to the left side of the stereo, C the center are the right, so you can produce stereo effects in your songs using this software. The M and the S buttons present on each channel stand for mute and solo, and these can be toggled on or off by left clicking them. If you mute a channel, then that channel will become silent and you will only be able to hear the sound from all the other channels, and you can mute multiple channels at the same time. If you solo a channel, that channel will play on its own and the rest of the channels will be silenced. This grey area here is where we will be placing our sequences of notes once we've created some. 
These numbers above the grey area represent the timeline. If we press play you will see that this marker moves along the timeline. Any notes that this line comes across in the sequences that we've placed, those notes will play. Now I'm going to press stop, which is this button here, and I'm going to point out now that if you press space, it will start and stop the playback, which is a handy shortcut rather than having to go down to play and stop all the time. You can manually move this marker around by clicking on the numbers in the timeline. And if you press play, or indeed press space to start the playback, the playback will start from wherever that marker is currently located. I'm going to move the marker back to the beginning now. This slider moves us through the timeline so we can quickly examine different parts of our song from the beginning right to the end and back again. So let's take a look at the buttons at the bottom of the screen. This one in the bottom right here is a metronome and that can be toggled on or off with a left click. It's supposed to give you a click track but I haven't been able to get this working. Again I think that may be an issue with the fact that I'm running the software through an emulator. So if you're running this on an actual ZX Spectrum Next that will probably work for you. This is the record button and that will allow us to place notes in real time while the song is playing by tapping on the keys on our computer keyboard. That's for use in the piano roll editor where we edit our sequences of notes. That will not work on this screen. As I've explained before this is the play button and this is the stop button. This button enables or disables the loop function which I will explain later. This button advances us to the end of our current loop this button takes us to the beginning of our current loop and these two buttons here advance us along the timeline one step at a time or back again. This button here enables us to flip pages. What I mean by that is that if we have our song playing and the markers over here and it gets to the end of the page, now let's take that further a bit, you'll see that the marker disappears off the end of the page and you don't get to see the rest of the song playing. You'll still be able to hear the song playing but you won't see where the marker is. You'll have to manually drag the slider to where the marker is in order to see it playing. However, if we have this button toggled on then when the marker gets to the end of the current page, as you will see, it flips the page to the next page automatically so you don't have to scan through manually using the slider. So let's get that uh, marker back to the beginning now. Now as promised I'm going to explain the loop function. You'll see here it says loop and there's this greyed out area of the timeline underneath where the numbers are. If I enable the loop function by clicking this button by toggling it on you'll see that the loop area lights up in blue and we can set the end of the loop by right clicking and the beginning of the loop by left clicking. So to demonstrate the loop I'm going to set the beginning of the loop at 3 and the end of the loop at 5. Now when I press play if the marker is inside that loop it will literally play that section of the song over and over again and this is useful when you're in the piano roll editor editing your sequences of notes. If you set the loop to the sequence you're currently working on that sequence will play over and over again so that you can change your notes and your placements of instruments and what have you as the song is playing. So let's stop that now, disable loop and I'll set everything back to the way it was. Bear with. Before we move on to creating sequences of notes to place into our song, I'm first going to rename some of these channels so that I know which instrument I'm going to be placing on each channel. This is optional, you don't have to rename these, but you can, so I'm going to do that now. On the first channel I'm going to be putting the piano sound, so that's what I'll name this channel, piano. The second channel, incidentally I'm double clicking on the channel names in order to be able to edit them. The second channel I'm going to leave blank because that is where the echo sound will reside for the piano instrument. The third channel I'm going to place the bass line. And the fourth channel, that's where the drum beat is going to go. And I'll be placing those three different drum sounds into the sequence that resides in the fourth channel. So drums, simple as that. Okay, so let's move on to creating some sequences of notes.
So now we're going to move on to the Piano Roll Editor, which is where we edit sequences of notes. But as I've explained before, if I click that button now, it doesn't take us there because we haven't yet created an empty sequence. So that's what we're going to do in a moment. We're going to create an empty sequence of notes here on channel 1, where the piano instrument is. And we're going to use that sequence to demonstrate how to place and edit notes. I'll also need to explain to you that we're going to be using the Cap Shift and Symbol Shift buttons on the Spectrum keyboard to activate different features. But for me, through the C-Spect emulator, I'm going to be using left shift and right shift on my computer keyboard. Left shift represents cap shift on the spectrum, and right shift represents symbol shift on the spectrum. So let's create our new empty sequence. If I hover over this section here where I want the sequence to be placed, I hold down cap shift and you'll see that the cursor changes to this pencil type symbol. And now left click that creates our empty sequence that we can now work on. If we left click on our sequence it becomes highlighted and some details appear down here which refer specifically to this sequence. This is the name of the sequence which I'm going to double click and rename demo because we're going to be deleting this sequence after we've used it. The duration changes how many bars long we want the sequence to be so changing that down to one makes the sequence one bar long up to three three bars long, etc. Transpose transposes the notes in that sequence up or down one semitone at a time. And usage simply refers to how many times this specific sequence has been used in this song. And this box here, if we double click that, that allows us to change the colour of the sequence box. We can now get into the Piano Roll Editor initially by double clicking our new sequence. This is the Piano Roll Editor. Now briefly I'm going to go back to the Song Arranger screen and just demonstrate that now we've created that sequence and gone into it, clicking the Piano Roll Editor will take us back to the sequence that they're currently editing. So now we're inside the Piano Roll Editor, as you can see. This is the name of the current sequence that we're working on, we call that Demo. This is the instrument that we're going to be placing. If I press keys on my keyboard, you'll hear that that is indeed the piano sound that we created. If we change that up, it will adjust which instrument we're working on. The instrument name underneath that can be adjusted when we have notes in the sequence highlighted. Changing that will change the instrument sound of the highlighted notes. This allows us to place more than one instrument sound into one sequence. This slider bar here allows us to scan to the right and to the left of our current sequence. You'll notice that there's a number one here and a number two. These represent the number of bars in our current sequence. If you remember we set our sequence length to two bars. Each of these two bars is divided into 16 equal spaces represented by these individual squares here. These squares are where we can place our individual notes. If I scan to the right now, you'll see that the area after the second bar is blanked out. That means that any notes we place in this area will not be played in this sequence because our sequence length is two bars. This little debris here is our quantize function and this can be toggled off and on with a left click. Its current setting of 1 in 16 will allow us to place up to 16 notes in one bar. Each of those notes will be exactly the same length and will perfectly fill each of these small note boxes. Adjusting this setting will allow us to get notes of different lengths. So for example if we change this to 1 in 8 we'll be able to fit 8 notes in each bar which means every individual note will perfectly fill two of these note boxes. We can change that all the way down to one in one, which means that one note will be exactly one bar in length. For now, we're going to leave this set to 16. Now I'm going to place a note at the beginning of our sequence, and I do that by holding down the caps button. You'll see that the mouse pointer changes to that pencil symbol, and I left click. That has placed a note in our sequence. Now if I click and hold that note, I can move it down in the position of the sequence and back up again. 
This changes the pitch of the note, and you will also hear that that note is gliding between one note and the next, which isn't particularly easy on the ears right now. So I'm going to go back to the patch editor, and you can see our piano instrument here has glide enabled. So I'm going to disable the glide and go back into the piano roll editor for the sequence that we're currently working on. And you'll now hear that when I click and move this note up and down, you can more clearly hear which note it is. This slider over here will allow us to scan up and down in the sequence so that we can have notes that are higher than the area that's currently visible and lower than the area that's currently visible. We can also place notes using the record function which is this button here. When this is enabled every key that we press on the keyboard which triggers a note will be placed into the sequence in real time like so. As well as being able to click and hold individual notes to move them around we can also draw boxes around sets of notes then if we click and hold one of those notes we can move the entire set around. Clicking on any empty space in the sequence will deselect those notes. The lengths of individual notes or groups of highlighted notes can be adjusted by hovering your mouse over the edge of the note and you'll see that an arrow appears. If you click and hold you can now adjust the length of the note and this also works on the other side of the note in the opposite direction. Individual notes or groups of notes that have been highlighted can be deleted by holding down caps and zero. Caps and zero. Caps and zero. Caps and zero. The final thing to demonstrate before we move on to creating our tutorial song is the loop function. Now currently if I press play you'll see that this timeline bar will move to the end of our sequence and then it moves on to the rest of the song which is not very helpful to us when we're trying to edit our sequence. So what I'm going to do now is I'm briefly going to go back to the song arranger screen and we can see the sequence that we're currently working on here. I'm going to go down here and enable the loop function with this button and with that loop function enabled the loop box lights up in blue and as I explained earlier when you left click that sets the start of the loop and when you right click that sets the end of the loop so I'm going to set the beginning of the loop at the start of our sequence and I'm going to set the end of the loop at the end of our sequence I'm also going to move this bar back to the beginning of our loop by pressing this button. Now when I go back into the piano roll editor with this button or by simply double clicking the sequence that I'm working on, you will see now that with the loop function enabled, pressing play, the timeline bar reaches the end of the sequence and comes back to the beginning and it will play that over and over again. And this is extremely helpful to us when we're trying to place notes. So let's go back into the Song Arranger screen and I'm going to delete our demo sequence by clicking and highlighting it, holding down caps and hitting zero. That's now gone and we're ready to start creating our tutorial song. I'm going to place my first empty sequence here on channel one, which I've renamed Piano. I'm going to hover the mouse where I want the sequence to appear, hold down caps, left click the mouse, there we have the sequence. I'll click it once to highlight it and rename it. So double click on the name to rename it. Melody. I'm going to double click on my sequence. That takes me into the piano roll editor. I'm going to start by placing my first note. This is the piano instrument that I have selected here. Now I'm going to place uh, notes randomly along this timeline uh, to fill up this sequence with my melody. I'm going to 
stick the loop function on them and see how that sounds. Okay, let's have a listen. That'll do me. Alright, let's go back to the Song Arranger screen. What I want to do now is create a copy of this sequence and place it just here. Now there are two ways to create copies. The first is to hover over the sequence, hold down the caps button and you'll see an equals sign appear above the hand. If I now left click and drag that sequence, you have a copy of that sequence next to it with the equal sign appearing on both. This means that if I make changes to one of the sequences, the other sequence will also change. So these sequences will always be identical. To demonstrate the other way of copying a sequence, first of all I'm going to delete this second sequence that I've created by clicking it, holding down caps and pressing zero. Now, if I hover over this first sequence that we created, hold down caps and then do a single press of symbol shift whilst holding down caps, you'll see there is a plus sign appearing above the hand. If I now, with caps held down, click and drag that sequence across, I've made an exact copy of the first sequence, but these are now independently editable. If I make changes to one, it will not make changes to the other. Now that we have our second sequence in place that we can independently edit, I'm going to double click it to go to the piano roll editor, but before I do, I'm going to set the beginning and the end of the loop to perfectly match this sequence, so that when we're editing it we can listen to this sequence being played over and over again. I'm also going to move the timeline bar to the beginning of the loop by clicking this button. I can also obviously manually move that around as I demonstrated earlier. I'll double click this sequence to go into the piano roll editor. We can now make changes to this sequence and we can press play to listen to this sequence looped over and over again. So I'm going to make these changes so that we get a bit of variation to the melody. OK, let's have a listen to that. Fine. I'm happy with that. So let's have a listen to what we've got so far. I'll go back to the Song Arranger screen. I'm going to disable the loop function and bring the timeline bar back to the beginning and then press play. Great all good so far. I'm going to make the total length of this song 8 bars from start to finish so all I need to do now is do an exact copy of these two sequences and move them to here. So I'm going to start by drawing a box around both of those to highlight them. I'm going to hover over one of them, hold down the caps button, left click and drag. Now we have an exact copy of the first two sequences here and here. So Let's press play and see what that sounds like. There we go. So now to create a bass line on channel 3. I'm going to place my first empty sequence here. I'm also going to set the loop to start and end to match that sequence and enable the loop function. I'm going to highlight this new sequence and I'm going to rename it so I know what I'm working with. I'm going to just call it Bass. 
and now let's double click it to go into it. I'll need to select my bass instrument here and before I place my first note I'm going to have a quick listen to the melody to make sure my bass note is in tune with that. Mm, that's my first note, okay. Let's place a note down now. Mm. Perfect, first time. What I'll also need to do is change the octave of that note down. So now, now I know I've got the correct note, I'm going to move this slider down so that I can get a lower note. Mm. So there I have my beginning note. So I'll go ahead and place the rest of the notes for this sequence now, and as before I'm just going to make up a tune as I go along. Okay, let's see what that sounds like. To move these in a little bit. Let's try that again. Okay, I'm happy with that. Let's go back to this song arranger screen. And I'm going to highlight what we've just created and make exact copies of that by holding down caps, left click and drag. A draw box around those two. Caps, left click and drag. Now we have four exact copies of the bass line and we'll play that back now to see what it sounds like. Lovely. So now to our drum beat, which I'm going to place on channel number four. I'll create my first empty sequence here by pressing caps and clicking. I'm going to highlight it, rename it, we'll just call it beats. I'm also going to turn on the loop function so we can listen to the notes in this sequence repeated. Double click it and we're ready to edit. I'm going to start with my bass drum, so I'm going to change the instrument name to bass drum. I'm going to place my first beat on this column. And because we're using only white noise, moving this up and down makes no difference to the sound, so it doesn't matter where we place that along there. And I'm going to go ahead and place the rest of my bass drum sounds now. I think that's it, let's have a listen. Yep, that's fine. For my snare drum sound, I'm going to place it physically higher up in the sequence, around about here, so that I can visibly distinguish between the bass drums and the snare drums. Now in order to be able to place a snare drum sound into the same sequence as a bass drum sound, I first need to place more bass drum sounds, so I'm going to put bass drum sounds in where I want my snare sounds to be. Now if I highlight all four of these new bass drum sounds, I can change this second setting here to snare drum and it will change the sound of the notes that I have highlighted. Now we have four snare drum sounds, let's hear what that sounds like. Okay. I'm going to place my hi-hat sounds around about here in the middle. Now as the default sound is bass drum currently, when I place instruments in where I want my hi-hats, they will be bass drums, so I'm going to go ahead as before and place bass drum sounds in where I want my hi-hats to be. Now I'm going to highlight all these new bass drum sounds and use the second setting to change them 
for hi-hats. Now we have our final drum beat, let's have a listen. It's also worth pointing out at this stage that because one sequence resides in one channel, we cannot have more than one sound playing at the same time in one sequence. So if I was to try to place a second note triggering at the same time as another note, only one of those notes will play. To complete our song now, I'm going to go back to the Song Arranger screen, and I'm going to duplicate our drum beat the way we did with the other sequences. I'm going to hold down caps, click and drag, highlight both, hold down caps, click and drag. I'm going to set the loop to finish at the end of our song, and I'm going to press play. If you wish to use an emulator to run next door, I recommend the C-Spect emulator. This is the emulator that I've been using to make this video. The download link will be in this video's description. I'm using the Windows operating system, so these instructions are for Windows, but if you're using a different operating system, these instructions should still help you. Getting next door to run in C-Spect isn't straightforward, so this is how you do it. Once you've downloaded the cspect zip file and extracted it to a folder on your desktop, you will need to copy the entire contents of the Nextdoor SD card into the cspect folder. Clicking on the cspect.exe file in the cspect folder will simply boot up the emulator in 48k spectrum mode, and that's not what we need. So, what we need to do is locate the nextdoor.nex file, which is now located in the cspect folder. This is the executable file that will load into the hardware of a ZX Spectrum Next. We need to associate .nex files with the cspect.exe program. To do that, we right click on the nextdoor.nex file, a pop up menu appears. We go to open with, and the list that then pops up will not have cspect showing on that list, so we have to select choose default program. A box then pops up, and again, C-Spect will not be showing on the list in that box, so we select More Options. The list that then pops up will again not have C-Spect on it, so we go to Look for another app on this PC. We scroll down to the bottom to find that. This will bring up a file browser. Using the file browser, we can navigate to the C-Spect folder, which is either on your desktop or wherever you extracted the files to. We then select the cspect.exe file, and then cspect will boot up with nextdoor running. From here on, whenever you double click the nextdoor.nex file, it will automatically load up into the cspect emulator. <laughs>